So our moderator for this panel is Michelle Viotti. Michelle is the manager for the NASA Mars Public Engagement Program, which covers formal education, informal education, and public outreach activities for NASA's Mars Exploration Program. In this position, uh, she leads a team of communications and education experts at JPL and coordinates the efforts of Mars-related education and public outreach uh, activities undertaken by, uh, undertaken by NASA centers and principal investigators at universities. Mars public engagement includes uh, Mars students imaging pro projects, Mars robotic exploration, uh, Imagine Mars and the Mars Museum Visualization Alliance, among others. And Michelle tells me just before we came up, she has been a Martian for 10 years and very proud out of it. So ladies and gentlemen, Michelle Viotti. Hi, everyone. So that's a big mouthful. But basically what all of us on this panel are here to talk about is really how to open discovery and innovation um, to everyone, and students in particular. And for this panel, how today's women on Mars, today's Martian women, uh, can influence the next generation. And I can kind of set the context and then we're going to be really informal. So feel free to ask questions at any point. Um, basically in this country we have a lot of challenges. Um, some recent national studies have come out showing that um, students are performing at the bottom of um, the developed world in, uh, uh, compared to students in other countries. And that's something that the country is really um, intent on changing. Um, even though we're talking about girls, we really want to include all students um, of all backgrounds and abilities uh, because there's a lot of talent out there uh, that we want to capture. Teachers are incredibly important uh, to this effort. I know that there are a lot of teachers out there. Um, those same studies show that uh, a majority of K-12 teachers uh, do not have a background in STEM uh, and in the fields that, in the subjects that they're actually teaching. Um, and they obviously need a lot of support for those teachers who do um, have backgrounds. Uh, STEM changes so frequently. It's such a dynamic area that providing teachers with opportunities um, to be part of um, discovery so that they can bring that back to their classrooms is also really important. Um, and of course we heard this morning um, how important it is for mentorship of girls as well um, from all of the scientists and, and engineers. Uh, who are currently participating in the, in the program or who are teaching at universities. Um, just to put a face on this, I have three quick um, little stories. One is from the Mars Student Imaging Project. Um, a uh, young woman in middle school uh, participated in a program uh, that allows students to take an image of Mars. They design their own research question and um, then get their image and actually publish a research report online. And uh, the student comes from a small town on the U.S.-Mexico border. She wrote her college entrance ex essay on what the program meant to her, got a full ride um, even through graduate school. And the most incredible um, story about her is that there was another student in her community. A lot of the kids have to work to support their families. He really wanted to participate. And she took his job temporarily so that he could actually participate. And so there are young heroes and heroines coming up um, in the force. Um, engineering came up this morning. Uh, I know a lot of women engineers in Mars who are so big uh, in terms of their advocacy of girls. And we had a recent example where they kind of poached from the scientists, um, a young talent, uh, just with their, their enthusiasm, so much so that I actually wanted to go back to school and <laughs> start building rovers. Um, and then the last story is Clara Ma, who was in sixth grade when she named our next Mars rover Curiosity. And not only is she a talent at writing, uh, she was recently the state semifinalist in her science competition and uh, just built a um, solar water purification project in her school. Um, so you'll be hearing a lot um, from her coming up. So all of the women on this panel have equally um, magical stories of, uh, of girls who are doing great things um, out there in science and engineering. And uh, we got together beforehand and decided instead of really long introductions, um, they were going to tell you about their career history in the context of um, what STEM education has meant to them and uh, where they see it going for girls. So just briefly in terms of uh, titles, they're far more accomplished than just this one title. Uh, but uh, Penny Boston is the director 
for Cave and Karst Studies program. I'm um, professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences Department at New Mexico Tech and the associate director of the National Cave and Karst Research Institute. And then we have Mary Liscom, who's the director of the Krista McAuliffe Center and Challenger Learning Center, Framingham State University. Shelley Canwright, NASA Director of Elementary, Secondary, and E Education. And Artemis Westenberg, who we heard from this morning, who's the president of Explore Mars. So I think Penny actually has some slides that I she do. would like to Somebody share. Somebody would find them for yes. me <laughs> first. And basically, the, the first question really is um, what I mentioned before uh, in terms of your own views on how you've influenced um, young women in STEM and some of your own experiences and students right. in general. Mm -hmm. Well, I was just uh, having lunch uh, with a friend of mine, Linda Billings, and uh, I mentioned to her because earlier today in the, in the previous panel it had come up about the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference. And the first time I went to that, it was still a single digit number <laughs> in 1979, and I was a graduate student. And when I went that year, I was the only woman of any age at that meeting. And I went a couple of years ago to the same conference, which has grown greatly in terms of total numbers, but uh, it has also blossomed in terms of the number of women that are showing up at that. And so that was uh, amazingly gratifying to see, really over the course of my 30-odd year career, uh, to see that uh, 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 really open up to women. And so as I approach my own educational efforts, which of course because of the nature of my job as a college professor, I focus a lot on higher education, but I also do a tremendous amount of outreach to uh, teachers, I do a lot of things with K-12 teachers, uh, particularly in the middle school and high school uh, ages, and the public at large. And so I try wherever I can to make a difference. And this is difficult as those, everyone in this uh, auditorium, I'm sure, has a very busy job. And so trying to shoehorn some of these additional activities in is not easy. Um, so when I think, let's see, maybe I should go to the podium here <clears throat> so I can actually see the slides. So when I think about my own history, of course, that's what informs what I do. Um, what made a difference to me in my life, and of course, I fell in love with astrobiology, which was then called exobiology when I was a little kid. As a science fiction reader, as so many kids who go into science are. And I read about Frank Drake and the, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and I came across the Drake equation in a copy of my weekly reader, which for those of you in my age bracket uh, who went to school in the United States, uh, you will know that this was a little kid newspaper that was distributed on a weekly basis, and it had all sorts of current events, and it was a major input of stimulation uh, across the board. This is how I learned about oceanography. This is how I learned about space. This is how I learned about all of the things that I had a real hard time deciding what I wanted to be, right? So there are too many sciences, and I was in love with them all. And so as a kid, I wanted to be an astronomer. I wanted to be a biologist. I wanted to be um, a veterinarian. I wanted to be an engineer. I wanted to work with robots. <laughs> I wanted to do all those things. And I also have a short attention span, which when you're a little kid, people beat you up for having a short attention span, but I think that it's one of the ingredients in my success, actually. And uh, combining those proclivities with the era in which I grew up, in which uh, we were in a geopolitical situation where Sputnik and all that that represented in terms of competition with the then Soviet Union, uh, forced this country to put a huge amount of attention and bucks into the whole issue of math and science and engineering education. And I, like uh, most of my generation in this country, are a product of that input of money and support and attention, and paying attention to the fact that that was really the future of the country. And so even though we no longer have a Soviet Union, we still have pressures upon us uh, as a nation, and we should be striving just as hard now in order to push those same science and technology goals for our children. And in many cases, we're sh uh, falling short, and the numbers are beginning to show that. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So what I've done is just throw three different projects that I have done uh, as pilot efforts uh, originally to try to make inroads in the places where I think are the most important. The ingredients that I think are the, the most important is research very early in a student's career. And it, from my point of view, this is early on in their college career. And I try to get freshmen involved in real science at the level that they can deal with it right away. Um, when you do that, 
You entrain them into the science and engineering community. You give them a reason to suffer through physics and chemistry and calculus, right? They're motivated to do that in a way that just the dry presentation of a curricula doesn't do. And um, a lot of this is really shoehorned into the program. So for example, the National Science Foundation has summer research experience for undergraduates. And so also does NASA and, and several other agencies. Um, but this is a labor of love because there is no faculty salary involved in this. You just take them on, and it's an extra burden. And I think the idea is that somehow you get their free labor. But as those of you who are teachers know, it's not free labor. It's a net input of your labor into, into their educational experience. So over, 13, uh, over six years, I've had 13 students. Uh, the bulk of them were women, uh, 11 of them. And of course, I, I work at a minority serving institution. Um, and so nine of these students were various minorities. And uh, after six years of this, taking them to caves, doing surface studies with them, um, all 11 of the women have gone on to higher degrees. And most of these women are Hispanic and do not come from families where anybody in their uh, family has ever gone on to college. And when they came to me, they had not been thinking about a research career. And so I know from direct experience that I have made a difference to at least 11 young women. Uh, and put them on the path of some sort of higher education. One has gone into forensics, one has gone into pharmacy, and the others have gone into various engineering and science fields. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, we have a very large Native American population in our state, a number of different tribes. Um, I'm particularly uh, bonded to the Navajo Nation people and some of the Pueblo people, but we have done uh, an an unfunded collaboration between my institution and Navajo Technical College in Crown Point uh, with some help from uh, colleagues like Jeff Antoll at NASA Langley uh, to actually do a pilot uh, LIDAR mapping project in one of my caves. And that was tremendously beneficial for the students. And we set up this collaboration. And now we are just lived through the pre-proposal round of a proposal to carry this forward so we can do more of this kind of work with students at Navajo Tech. And my last slide, please. And then uh, another effort that I have done as a pilot effort is to uh, reach out in a more formal way to our teachers' um, master's in science teaching uh, program that we have at my institution, where uh, talented uh, middle school and high school uh, teachers come to us for a master's degree with a specialty in teaching a technical field. And, uh, Summer before last, we did a major field experience for six of these teachers uh, who are in-service teachers with uh, three undergraduate teachers and uh, my graduate student, one of my graduate students, and took them into caves. We took them and spent a week at the Mars Desert Research uh, Station in Utah. And this has further cemented my view that getting teachers and students out into the field or into the laboratory or into the uh, design studio right away and do real things with them, that's the key. And so that's what I use as the linchpin in my educational efforts. Thanks. Okay, I'm Mary Liscom, and I'm a teacher, despite the fact that it might say I'm the director of the Krista McAuliffe Center. That's what I do now. And I have to do budgets and things like that. But in my heart, I'm a teacher, and I knew I wanted to teach from the time I was seven years old. I did have a little divergence in that path when I took a, um, an aptitude test in high school, and it said I should be looking into a career in mechanical engineering. Unfortunately, no one told me what that was. So guidance counselors are like on my list. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> I had no idea, and um, I thought it was going to, you know, they wanted me to repair automobiles or something, so it just didn't, like, work out. So I did end up uh, getting into teaching, and I'm at Framingham State University. The Krista McAuliffe Center has a uh, challenger learning center, center there, too. Okay, next. Uh, can I move these? I guess maybe. Um, the primary... Um, mission of the Krista McAuliffe Center is educational outreach 
and we are there to support teachers in their work, which gives me a lot of latitude. We have a very um, substantial undergraduate teaching program at Framingham State, of which I'm an alum, and uh, Krista McAuliffe and I were in the same class there. So um, I guess if I had to mention someone who really had an impact on my life, it would be, it would be Krista at this point. So. And uh, as you know, Krista was teacher in space. She um, applied with um, 14,000 people took out applications, 11,000 teachers applied, and Krista was, was chosen. And this is something that we don't dwell on, the, the accident, because our Challenger Learning Center is uh, what we're really uh, into. We see 12,000 middle school kids through the program every single year and through our planetarium programs as well. So. The current mission that we fly, interestingly enough, is Voyage to Mars. So when you talk about being a Martian, we go there twice a day, every day, 350 times a school year. And we have middle school students, and we consider middle school to be grades 5 through 8. And you'll get to see them in action in just a minute. But uh, the enthusiasm that these students have is amazing. And this is a, a picture of our, our um, Mars control area, and uh, you'll see, you see students in there right now. Uh, we just, uh, this past summer, got into the 21st century with, with some new software and computers, and, and the teachers always get excited. One thing I've learned about getting teachers excited about something is you always have to show them something new every year. And we have teachers who have brought their students to the Krista McAuliffe Center now for 18 years. We've had teachers who have retired under my watch, and I'm wondering, what am I still doing? <laughs> uh, and they, uh, it's quite exciting. But uh, the, the students who come in there, the fifth graders, you can't convince them that they didn't go to Mars. And when eighth graders walk in, and they're, they're the love of my life, honestly. I love teaching eighth graders. But they walk in like, OK, show me. you know. And they got the attitude on. And you know, five minutes into the program, and they're sold. They, they you know. Until we say your ground transportation is here to take you back, they, you know, they're on Mars. And uh, we've added in, in our, in our center, we've added in a space weather team, which we're very excited about. We were the first Challenger Center out of the 50 that are around the United States, Canada, the UK, and South Korea. Um, so we, we added a space weather team, and we've been very fortunate to work with the folks at Goddard Space Flight Center. And um, some of the components for the um, SDO mission were designed at the Center for Astrophysics at, at Harvard. So we work with their education department there to, to create the team. And the uh, way back, that green screen area is where the, the students actually um, announced that we may have a solar event happening and what are the precautions that they have to say. And so then they get you know, to see themselves giving this message to their teammates, and it's quite exciting for them to do that. This is our space station. If you haven't been to a Challenger Center, uh, it's amazing. I, I know that like in some Challenger Centers, they tested to see just how engaged the kids were. And um, Big Bird in full costume walk through, and the kids, hmm, okay, yeah, Big Bird's here. You know, they're just so busy. <laughs> so it's very, very exciting, and they, they really do get their hands on it. And, and the, I guess the biggest endorsement that we have is that one of the, the kids said, you know, well, lots of kids say this, but this kid put it aptly. He said, I've been to Disney World, and it was really cool, but I got to go on all the rides there. Here I got to actually do the mission. So they really feel like they're really involved. And another shot of mission control. And um, it's, it's very, very, very um, exciting. It lasts about two hours. And we prepare the teachers ahead of time with curriculum and workshops. And this past week, we had a, a workshop with uh, our new generation of teachers. We're finally seeing people younger than me there. And um, they, we strongly believe that in order for teachers to be able to engage and embrace a new concept or a new way of learning, they have to be involved in what they're going to teach. So we flew a mission with them. And one of the teachers said, you know, when I was coming here this morning, my son said, Mom, you don't, you don't look like you're getting ready to go to school. Where are you going? And she said, well, I'm going to Mars because Mars needs mothers. 
and the child started crying. <laughs> so she said uh, that I had to explain that I would be back. It wasn't that long of a trip. <laughs> so, um, and this is actually a little um, video of the students in action. It's on our website. So. And uh, the, the text in this is uh, comments that we've gotten from teachers and students. We haven't figured out how to add sound on our website. I think I need a new webmaster. <laughs> we are now Framingham State University. Um, we just became a university last year, and that's mostly for our, our um, out-of-country um, programs that we run. In other parts of the world, the college is considered like high school, so we got a new name. And the kids are very engaged building probes. They're um, involved in collecting data. They're involved in interpreting that data. And um, people ask me, what's the difference between a fifth grade mission and, a, um, and an eighth grade mission? And the eighth graders get in more deeply, so more emergencies happen that they have to, have to solve. And we're all about teamwork, communications, problem solving and decision making, which are all 21st century skills. And we do fly um, team building um, programs for our, our MBA students, our graduate students at Framingham State, and the professor really believes that the Challenger mission helps them establish themselves as a cohort um, team as they go through the program. And they have to design a mission patch that reflects what their mission is all about when they're there. So it's quite interesting. And um, the other part that we're really interested in is um, working with our pre-service teachers. And we want to get them really engaged in inquiry-based science and use our resources at the McAuliffe Center to get them engaged. And what we found is that a lot of our, our pre-service teachers uh, want to be elementary or early childhood. And when I speak to the early childhood candidates, they tell me that they're doing that to avoid math and science, which scares me. <laughs> um, it's, it's not really, it's, it's just not what we want. So just like Penny, we take them um, in a summer program for, for 10 weeks. Um, we get them truly immersed in inquiry learning. We teach them that a good teacher um, never does more work than their students. The students should be the one really working in the class, not them, and really getting um, their students engaged is important. We've taken them to um, Raytheon, to Genzyme, to um, the um, visualization labs at Harvard, MIT, and their favorite trip was to go to Perkins School for the Blind to learn about modifications and adaptations for students who are visually impaired. And that was just an amazing trip. See? And um, so these are some more of the, the content that we teach them. They do Lego robotics. We have them learn how to uh, learn about space weather and use that as the context for having themselves. And then this, the, the middle school students that they work with in the summertime have to um, come up with stop action animation, also known as claymation. And uh, the Framingham Public Schools, where we are, um, said, we, we don't get it. You know, we have parents night all year long. But when you do a program with our kids in the summertime, all of the parents want to come. And they, and they do. And we run our movies like a, in our planetarium dome that the students create, and it's, it's quite exciting. So those are some of the things that we do. These are, this is a group of last year's interns. And um, we were sponsored by the Commonwealth Corps um, in Massachusetts, which is like the Peace Corps. So we had to tie in service learning. And what I've learned over the years with robotics and anything that we do is that for young women, a real draw for them is service learning, if, or, or giving service or doing something for society. So if they're um, designing something with robotics, if they can design something to help someone else solve a problem or whatever, that's how we, we catch them. And then we move on into more of the competitions. And uh, we do touch the future. We do teach. And these are some of the students we had um, about, I think we had like 140 students last summer. Um, they did those two programs I, I spoke about. And they also went to the Framingham schools where the cable 
television programs are are produced for um, for Framingham, and they had to come up with a societal um, problem to solve. And what the students chose was um, was childhood obesity, which surprised us. And they they went out and did the interviews and the reviews and learned about what proper nutrition was. And we, then we related that to think about a, a diet that you would that you would, or a, um, a menu choices that you would take on a trip to Mars or a trip to space. So it was kind of, it was very interesting for them. And these are some of our students uh, doing Lego robotics. Again, um, this was a couple of years ago. We moved on to the new Legos, um, and they changed things around. So we had to change our program so that now we have a surface of Mars um, program that we do as well. And these are some of our, uh, our, our interns, and what they were doing there is trying to design a spatula that could reach to the back of a stove and pick up a, a, a significant amount of weight. And uh, they had to learn the math involved with that to figure out, um, you know, they, they really got involved in how many washers they could put on there, and they really weren't considering that the length of the spatula when you do the formula was going to be really important to that. So that's always a surprise to them at the end. And this is our, our map for the Mars, um, our mat for the for the Mars um, challenge. And the r robot has to come down off that ramp, follow the trail around, pick up the ball, come over to the wall and back away with the sensors, and then go and deposit the um, the ball at the end, and then back that rover back up on the ramp to complete the. Um, to complete the task, and they just will have at it until it's done. You know, they just this is both our our young women who want to be teachers, who many of them never touched a Lego in their life, which kind of surprises me. But then, I had brothers, so I guess I did. that's a difference. And you can see some of the young women were really excited about this as well. Um, we also work with. Um, Children who are from inner cities, uh, these, are, these are kids from all over Boston who come out on Saturdays and work with us to do Lego robotics. They fly the mission. They go to our planetarium. We take them to the Soldier System Center in, in Natick where they, they see simulations of arid and um, polar um, environments. And they, um, our Soldier System Center uh, also has a, a science lab set up there for any high school chemistry teacher can bring their class in there and use all of their equipment and everything too, which is really cool. So um, these are some of our partners uh, we're very proud of. And we've, we've received funding from just about all these people, or we've shared funding with them. And I think that's about it for me. So thank you. It's OK if I just sit here. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think you'll bring it all together because we've heard at the higher ed level and the K-12 and you cross-cut both of them. I so do, go for I it. do. So <laughs> just a, a few key nuggets of terms that I think throughout our discussion here, uh, I, I hope I will be able to, to emphasize um, about myself and how my commitment in these areas, I think, spans through my, my whole career and what we're doing at, at NASA. The first of those would be avocation vocation. Uh, I have been a, an educator since I was a teenager and have stayed true to that path uh, through my, my career. It is not something that I just do at the job. I do outside the workplace as, as well. And I think we see a lot of that with our researchers who uh, feel very strongly about what they're doing, both at the workplace as well as outside the workplace. But what started that path for me was working with incarcerated youth as I was a teenager and had an opportunity to work with uh, high school boys, maximum security. And it was at that point, uh, it was a major milestone for, for me that took me a whole different direction. I was good in science and, and math and thought I was going to go the, the medical route. But at that moment, I did a very deliberate pause and asked myself, unimagined possibilities. These youth have no idea what their possibilities might be. Who could be a very important influence in their life? And where would that influence need to be? And where do I need to be? Uh, that took me into education. I began working in the inner city, urban setting, uh, and worked long and hard at, at that point. I am also a calculated risk taker. So as I began to get wedded to a community, I realized that this was not enough. If you really want every child to have 
unimagined possibilities. Couldn't just stop with a child, and it couldn't just stop in the, the community, the school district. Couldn't just even stop, stop in the state. And you couldn't stop with a student. You also needed to reach the teacher, as well as the parent, and all of those that were going to be influencers for that child, so that child could have unimagined possibilities. That's how I ended up with NASA, and actually came on board under the Teacher in Space program, although not as one of those finalists, but that actually is how I got invited to, to come and work with NASA, because of how I was beginning to, to work with youth, youth and, and educators. Um, because. What I'm trying to do in my lifetime, and I hope with, with others, is to maximize the impact that we can have, wherever that child is, uh, whatever that child's boy, girl, or any color, what can we do to help maximize their, their potential? So there's a very deliberate process. That's take it again, a calculated risk taker. So there is some deliberation. And here at NASA, one of the things that we're very strong with is research. So I follow the research. I do a great deal of research myself. As I think about direction and need, and as we look at this discussion of, of women, we know we have a leaky pipeline. You know, everything that we've talked about right here and all the evidence still tells us the same things. But as I, working at NASA, look at all this research and try to maximize the impact, one thing that we've begun to do is place a very strategic focus on a few key areas because we can't do it all, but where can we do it to ma maximize the impact? So through our discussion here, I think you're going to hear some of these threads. One of those areas that we have uh, really taken a very specific target towards is looking at the underrepresented, underserved, and or underperforming student in STEM. We also are focusing on middle school. And we are focusing, placing a lot more attention on out of school programming. The last thing to say that kind of helps drive or gives us direction is the priorities of this country. From the very top, President Obama has outlined consistently since he has taken office the importance of STEM and the importance of women and girls. In 2009, he established the White House Council on Women and Girls. One of the first actions that was undertaken by this council was to look at themselves, federal agencies. What are we doing in this area? What more should we be doing? And the outcome of that study, that report for NASA, has now begun to give us direction and some new programs that we've actually put into place as a result of that report. The other thing that, uh, about the same time, President Obama announced Educate to Innovate. And you've probably heard about that campaign, but did you know that of the three pillars, there is one pillar, it's all about STEM. One of his three pillars under that is about women and girls. And he says, expand STEM education and career opportunities for underrepresented groups, including women and girls. So as we continue uh, this discussion, I'm sure we'll have a chance to kind of pull these points back. But as far as introducing myself, you can see I'm very passionate about education and about the kids and whomever it takes to help make the difference in their lives. I want to be there alongside them. Thank you. Okay, um, I myself have loved to teach from a very early age. Uh, always taught, uh, even in a village school I was, when I was 11 years old, when a teacher would go ill in third grade, you know, I was, you know, far ahead of my class, I could teach that class. Looking back at it, I have no idea how I did it, but I did it and I loved it, to be honest. So I've always loved to teach. Uh, what I don't love, though, is the educational system. So I never became a, a vested teacher in the system, but I kept teaching stuff, uh, you know, when people would ask me. And I love to teach the, uh, the, the first to eighth grade kids. I mean, all of them. Of course, it's different if you go into a class uh, of... Uh, you know, four or five years old, or a class of 11, 12, or 13 year olds, but it's all, uh, you know, good fun, and it's a challenge to engage them. Why do I do it? Because personally, I believe that every child has a right to be stimulated and find its talent, and that should be regardless of the neighborhood you live in, or your gender, or whatever else might be, you know, wrong with your life. Uh, you should have the opportunity to find your talent, to find your passion, and that make your life. And 
over all these years, I have seen, like I think many of my colleagues, that regrettably, very often, there is a divide between male and female, uh, you know, girls do languages and boys do engineering, regardless whether these boys are really that handy and girls are really that, you know, um, well-doing in languages. And, and so uh, for this, I was very happy when at Explore Mars, we started a program where we said, you know, to reach 300 million people, uh, you know, let's start with the United States. I would like to reach 7 billion, but, you know, let's start small. Um, uh, the, the best way of doing it is reach the teachers, because, you know, then I, I, I touch more kids. So we started a program by which we, we wanted to uh, engage teachers in using Mars, which is a really great tool, because Mars is not just a dot of light in the sky. Mars is a place you can envision, like you know you do in your, your center. You, you can tell people and kids that you can go there and you know have a rover drive there, perhaps later on have people drive uh, run around. And so it's, it's, it's a very imaginative place, and you can do so many different sorts of science. You can make STEM uh, visible and tangible. Because what, what research has found all over the world, that one of the problems why there is a divide between female and males is that girls tend to ask, why? Why is this formula in, in mathematics used in this instance? Now, there are very many math teachers who cannot answer that question because, you know, they go through the motion and they know their math, but to go into this kind of question is actually higher math. And, you know, girls want to know that. And if, they, if these questions are never answered, then very often girls lose interest. Now, I think that doesn't tell me that these girls are, you know, bad math mathematicians, probably not at all, but it's just they have a different need. And I think a society, any society, cannot afford to lose half of its population's talents just because perhaps the education system isn't geared toward them. So to keep them interested and to show them that all this math has you know, applicabilities in their daily life, I think uh, using STEM, using centers like that, and using an education challenge where you tell t teachers, you know, tell us how you would you use Mars or perhaps already using Mars to teach your science, whatever science that is, you know, give it to us. We will put it on the web so we can, in a way, you can give it to all the other teachers and in so spread the wealth of your knowledge and experience. And, uh, you know, this is only the second year that this educational program runs. Uh, we've had webinars with the winners of the uh, last year program. And it's, I, I am certain this is going to work. And the fun is, it's not just going to work in this, this United States. We already had requests from Canada. I know there's interest in Europe because Europe has the same problem. You know, girls, you know, go out of STEM and, and go into services and, and, you know, perhaps medical profession, if, if anything, technical. And that's it. And of course, it's, it's, it's silly. So we need this. This is a way of engaging them. And it's, it's a fairly easy way of engaging them because, you know, all this great NASA science is there at our fingertips. We can use it. Let's put it to good use and uh, invigorate uh, any boy and girl into, you know, seeing the use of all this uh, technical education that they're forced upon in school. Great. So taking um, Shelley's phrase of unimagined possibility, and you were just reflecting on this as well, how do we make that concrete? What are the most important things that we can do in STEM education for girls and for all students um, to really make that real for kids? Um, we've heard experiences out in the field, simulations, and changes in um, gender stereotypes. Um, what are the key things? I'll throw two out to begin the discussion. I think first is relevancy. Uh, they have to see the relevancy, uh, yes. particularly if we're thinking the formal classroom, the relevancy behind what they are doing to real life. And I think uh, that's one thing that we can, can bring through this, this discussion. Uh, tied to that is with that relevancy, they need to... to have the role models, and I know that's going to be a common thread. And, and by role models, again, now I'm talking in the classroom. Um, 
if I tie back into my out-of-school programming, there's a lot of after-school clubs. Um, we spend a great deal of time at NASA, and, and these ladies do also, with the, the educator, doing the professional development with the educator. How many of those after-school clubs, let's say in a STEM area, are being led by a female? Uh, I mean, talk about a role model. That's one reason, one of the things that we're trying to do is uh, bring educators to, to, to NASA or engage them in some manner so that, or the community providers, so that they feel confident enough that they can stand up that, that club and be that, that first place role model for the, the young girl. So I think relevancy and, and the, the professional development and role models are a couple things that we should bring to the table. Yeah, I fully agree. I mean, if my math teacher would have told me that algorithms uh, would one day, you know, make it possible for an MRI scanner to, you know, to scan my body and tell the doctor whether I was ill, and without the algorithms, uh, all the data that the scanner would give the doctor would be such an enormous amount uh, that there would be no heads or tail of the uh, of the information that only the algorithms can make it into something that is useful and of course that comes from satellites actually then i think i would have paid better attention to you know doing my math mm -hmm. and there are other subjects in math that would have been you know far more interesting the moment i would have known that you know they had direct relevance to my life mm -hmm. It's not just the it's not just the teachers that we have to um, influence. It's actually parents that we have to influence as well, and and mothers. Because one of the biggest um, concerns I have is that I've never heard a mother brag to her child, male or female, that she couldn't read, but I have heard them brag that they can't do math and that they don't need it. They've lived their whole life really with why do they have to know an algebraic equation or, or whatever. So I think we have to change attitudes among all of the women, not just those of us here at this conference or those in the schools, but all of the women to encourage our daughters to, to take math courses and science courses. And I mean, I see it in these young women who want to be teachers. I, I always make sure I have a couple of math majors in there. Um, and they, uh, this is in, the, in our summer uh, internship program, and it's interesting because the, I talked to the math majors and I said, you know, make sure you share why you like being a math major. And when the first time every summer when one of them says, I love math, the rest of them go, yeah, but why? why? How can you possibly love math? And so we have to change the way we, we think about it in our culture. So. How about use of technology? It seems like a lot of the programs that you were talking about had that element, um, especially for helping girls see um, the tools that scientists and engineers actually use mm -hmm. in a real world application. Yeah, let me try that one first. Stuff helps, right? Stuff helps. And I think that there's a couple of really important reasons why being exposed to techniques, technologies, methodologies, helps women, and that is that one of the, the ways that I see women falling off in increasing numbers at every stage in their career has to do with uh, more fearfulness in terms of breaking something, trying something, and screwing it up. And I don't know why that afflicts young women uh, and, and girls more than it does young boys and young men, but I see it. And there is some disconnect, I don't know whether it's in the fourth grade or the eighth grade or when this happens, that I think of as the debrainification of, of, of the female part of the class. And I don't know how that happens and I don't know why that happens and I don't know how those of us that have not been afflicted by that have survived that, but that's a key. And I think a lot of that has to do with uh, embracing your own fear of making a mistake and looking stupid. And girls have that much more than boys do. And stuff that you can tangibly manipulate, competencies that you can get with a scanning electron microscope or, or uh, Lego robots or whatever it is, that helps to combat that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had that myself as a, as a kid. And I came from a fairly fearless family, you know. But even I felt that. 
and I, and I overcame it. And I, so I think that the role of technology is not just new ways to get clickers into the classroom or something. It's stuff that they can do so that they can learn that they can get competency in manipulating things in the world to do things and analyze things. One, one thing as a teacher that we learn in middle school is that the minute the boys', the boys um, voices start to drop, the girls shut up in class. So actively engaged young girls in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade become very quiet once the boys' voices drop a couple of octaves. And that's that. <laughs> It's true. Oh, and the boys are fearless. They'll, they'll say anything, you know. And, and as a teacher, one of the things that I try to impart to my young teachers is to stop and wait because boys don't care what they, it's right or wrong. They don't even care if they raise their hand. They'll shout, shout things out. So you have to set a climate and a culture in your classroom that has the boys wait and that you wait because the girls will take a little longer to formulate their answers to their questions than boys do. And this we've seen with the robotics and the, with the planning is that the boys you know, immediately want to build something that they can crash into each other. And they don't even care that we were given different directions you know, <laughs> or different goals. And um, the girls really want to take some time to work out the social issues of how are we going to do this and what's going to happen. So these are things that we need to be thinking about in our culture, even as adults. Because except, you know, running of the brides at Filene's basement, girls will generally hold back. <laughs> yeah, I personally think that has to do with the fact that if you're a young girl, you're rewarded by your family, if, even if it's not your direct parents. Uh, if you are well behaved, mm -hmm. boys that, you know, break things and are wild, oh, that's okay, they're a boy. And I think so, you know, from, you know, even when you're two years old, you learn not to break things. And of course, I believe, because I see this in using computers, I myself have been using computers since 72. Okay, that didn't really look like much of a computer. Uh, it was my science and my math teacher who had one, and if we were careful, we could use it, you know, one hour in a month or so, so it wasn't much. So, but, so I've been growing up with computers, so I'm less fearful that if I push a button that this computer will, you know, uh, spontaneously combust or something. Yeah. But I can tell that many women, uh, you know, highly educated women uh, ever, even have this fear that if I push this button, then this, this, this expensive machine, because it's still an expensive machine, even if it's only $500, uh, will, you know, uh, now stop working spontaneously and never, you know, rise again or something. And, and, and so, and because of, I think, this inbred idea that you don't break things uh, is, is, I think, one of the reasons why, why women then stop, you know, trying to push buttons on a computer. If it's not doing this, let's try this, this button or that button. And boys keep doing that. I mean, even if it does combust spontaneously, they, they're not worried about it. And, uh, and so, you know, I think that's one of the things. And, of course, to, to, to combat that, is very hard. I mean, I think you're right, you know, giving a bit more space and time to girls to, you know, to get, to formulate their answer and their strategy is probably a good way of doing it. And also keep telling, you know, people, uh, women especially, that, you know, most machines don't break if you push the wrong button. Mm -hmm. Computers are no different. I noticed a question from the audience, so we'll take one. I'm a science teacher, and I actually work in an outreach science program. So I'm one of the out-of-school programs where I give my kids an extra dose of science every day for high-risk kids um, in Santa Ana. And something I always do with them, so I see hundreds of kids every week, um, same kids every week. I ask them to draw a picture of a scientist. Mm -hmm. And inevitably, they'll draw a picture of a middle-aged white guy, balding, glasses. They draw my dad. <laughs> and at the end, I always ask them, why didn't you draw me? I'm a scientist. Why didn't you draw yourself? <laughs> Yeah. I'm like, if I give them crayons, I'm like, what, why is this person yellow? Like, yeah. what, what went wrong? And one of the things I think that you could address is the media. Name for me a pop, pop scientist who's a female. Mm. Anyone? You've got Bill Don't Nye the Science Guy. Don't you've got care. Mr. Wizard. Mm -hmm. You've got Jimmy Neutron, who's a little car cartoon character. And, um, sorry, I get In nervous the Big talking. Bang we have with Big Penny. Bang Theory. Thank yeah. you. Penny the dummy across the hall. You know, that one, that is one that they actually bring up when my kids watch TV. And what's this, the, the, the stereotypical image? 
of the scientist, the one who's, who's smart on there, they nerdified her as much as they could. She doesn't look like me. She doesn't look like them. Mm -hmm. So when my kids are like, oh, you're a scientist, you're pretty, I'm like, well, thank you. I appreciate that compliment, Mr. Fifth Grader or Ms. Fifth Grader. But I, something went wrong. That door, they don't see themselves, and especially my kids, whose, whose parents did not go to college. I'm very lucky. I went to a women's college for undergrad. So it wasn't weird. And didn't, I didn't think there was a gender gap until I started teaching. And <laughs> it's ignorant because I lived in this world where I had um, it was a really strong astrophysics program, but for my kids, it's not there. So, mm. so, th so this is a two-way conversation. Like, what would you what would you suggest? I want to see a science program for kids, but I want to see the anchor be a strong woman. I don't I don't want it to be a show about women in science because I want it to engage everyone. I just want it to be a show where I'm the lead or, or somebody like me. So where where Jane themselves. is the science girl. Yeah, and not the girl who's the backup, you know? Right. Or no, uh, no, Mythbusters. Side. Mythbusters is great. Everybody knows there's a hot chick on there. Sure. I actually didn't know. I actually, I no, she's awesome. just the hot chick on Mythbusters. <laughs> I want to see, see myself reflected in the media because the media has such a strong influence with them. Mm -hmm. I did not fully appreciate that until I started teaching fifth graders. Right. And they started telling me about um, uh, the Jersey Shore which I thought was a geographic location. It's not. <laughs> I think Kenny has a response to us. Yeah, I actually have to tell you something that happened to me a couple of years ago. I was um, being courted by the History Channel to be a host, a science chick, <laughs> on a particular program. And in the end, they wind up, well, they wound up giving the host position to somebody else who happened to be a man. And what the producer and director told me at the end was a bias that permeates the media, at least in this country. I don't know about internationally. In the, in the Netherlands, too. What he said was, this is fairly crude, okay? So <laughs> he said, when there's a man who's attractive and is the host of a science show or an informational show or something, all the women in the audience want to sleep with him and the men in the audience don't care, they just want to have a beer with him. But if you have an attractive uh, woman presenting as the chief anchor or host of a program, the men may want to sleep with her, but their women get angry, okay? Now, that possibly really? is the most sexist thing that anybody <laughs> had actually said to me out loud in probably 20 years. And uh, my jaw dropped, and I thought, well, no wonder that's all we see on TV because the apparatus that creates shows and puts them on there, that's their sexism that we're seeing. And I guess the only advice I have is that we have to demand something different. You know, there are wonderful science hosts like David Suzuki and, uh, and people like that, you know. Why aren't there women? And I've always wondered about it and that, boy, that really opened my eyes in a very unpleasant way. I live in LA as well, so I. <laughs> my my answer is we're going to sign you up for some video work yeah. really soon. Yeah. All right. And okay. by the way, ask them to draw an engineer and see what you get. Oh, Same problem. Cool. Say it's PBS. She get her contact information. That's fantastic. <laughs> and there's at least one woman on MythBusters. So true. <laughs> true. The the other thing I was just going to point out is that at my, my where I work, I work at the Discovery Science Center. I am the only outreach science teacher. Um, there's a lot of women, but I am the only female faculty member there who has a hard science background. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody else is there because of all the massive layoffs in California. If you're multi-subject credentialed in elementary school, you can teach science. Mm -hmm. So ah. there's, mm -hmm. there's no incentive. Okay. Wow. I have a graduate degree in molecular genetics. I love teaching, but it doesn't pay. <laughs> and it's a real problem. So I'd like to see more people like myself go into science. I don't know how to change that thought process as well, but we have this image of elementary school teachers and they're just, we're so looked down on. So. 
Thank you for your contribution. I, I did notice that the Discovery Channel show the universe. About half of the scientists that they have talking about the universe are, are women, approximately. Yeah. And it's really nice to see. It is. Go ahead. I just wanted to uh, run by a theory that I had read recently um, that while a lot of women think of their mothers as their role model if they've been a strong woman, that it actually is the influence of the father yes. mm -hmm. that That's is correct. what sort of guarantees that that woman will stay in a male-dominated field. And I wonder if that's something that yep. you see when you educate that mm -hmm. it's direct correlation between how involved and how overtly proud of their daughter the father is that um, helps sustain them through some of the doubts you get to when you get to middle, high, and even higher grades of schooling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're right. <laughs> yeah, I think we see it. I, I've seen that in my own uh, undergraduate advisees and my own graduate students. And if, uh, if you have a lousy dad, you have to overcome it. It's harder because it doesn't give you that foundation. And those of us who are blessed with wonderful dads who are really supportive uh, have that gift. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you can share with or perhaps we're talking about male role models sort of compensate with with male role model teachers or is that not possible to foster as another solution? I would think that it would help a lot, mm -hmm. you know. There is a body of literature on that, and I'm, I'm happy to share that with Chris if he wants to share it back, back out, because in that body of research, they talk about what are some strategies or tactics to, to take. I just didn't bring that particular body with me. So, but yes, the point's well taken is that it's surprisingly the influence of the father on the girl and the courses she's going to take in staying in math and science is more by the father than the mother, and the mother is the one that says, well, hey, I didn't do well in math or science. Mm -hmm. Anyways, that's okay if, if you're not. But if the father says something counter to that, the daughter's likely to stay more on track. I actually have a comment. Um, I have Could you stand up? Yeah. Oops. Careful. <laughs> I got this. I'm good. Um, we have to fix women's shoes, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah they lost their pockets. <laughs> My mom's actually a single mom, and my dad doesn't influence anything I do at school at all. So I, I disagree with you. I would disagree with that theory that they have a better impact on the math and science. I don't think that's true at all. My mom's actually, she graduated, you got your degree in chemistry, right? She got a degree in chemistry, and she, this is the only reason I'm interested in science and math. And that's it. I, she I mean, is, I don't. She is your key influencer. Yes. yes. I'm not saying I don't like my dad. Mm -hmm. He just had. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that. I'm saying he's, he has like no impact. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Well, I think what we're talking about here too, in terms of how to support women, it's really a societal <laughs> issue, and we need men and women to to support mm -hmm. um, girls and boys. Um, but um, appreciate the comment. I've um, been talking to many of you before the conference and listening here, and Artemis and I have been talking to a lot of space-related STEM organizations over the past year as we've been trying to develop our STEM programs. You've noticed there are a lot of programs out there that don't communicate. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of organizations don't have a clue what NASA's up to. They have some great outreach programs, but a lot of people don't know about it. That's not NASA's fault. But And the Conrad Foundation has wonderful programs. A lot of people don't know about it. You'd probably be surprised how many people don't know about Challenger Centers either. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me, and we'd had some early discussions on this, it must be a way to try to bring the groups together, even in a kind of an informal way, creating an umbrella organization. What would you say if, you know, we would like, Explore Mars would like to propose to create an umbrella organization for space-related STEM organizations so we can start communicating, maybe a couple, maybe just a couple times a year, share information, maybe have a website, you know, to put key pieces of information that not only our groups can kind of look at, but also science teachers can also look at. And we could probably invite most of the other groups as well. I mean, we could call it, call it something like Space STEM Education Alliance, just a loose umbrella group, uh, you know, each of us could join and just trade information. Do you think something like this might work? I think it definitely could work if we're willing to make the, the commitment to make it work. And I'd like to see scientists um, engaged in this as well because I think it's, it's really important to... To, for even for for those of us in education, we constantly have to connect with what's going on in science. And I think um, I look at 
at the job that we do at, at McCall Center, et cetera, to be like interpreting a lot of what scientists say. So it's it's really important that we keep in contact with them. And by interpreting, I mean putting it on a level that a, a fifth grader can can have some grasp of. So well, I, I think we certainly could get plenty of scientists and mm -hmm. engineers and others involved right. in you know, Explore Mars certainly happy to kind of be the catalyst for this and help what a and set things out. We can't be responsible for running everything all the time, but mm -hmm. we're absolutely happy to uh, start putting together you know, this umbrella group that people are interested in doing. And we'd be happy to send out a press release that you could all review at some point in the next day or two as well, kind of announcing this initiative if you're all on board. I think I put a little cautionary note uh, to that. I say this needs to be a very deliberate process approach and the first step is doing some benchmarking you've mentioned a few there are hundreds out there uh, you need to focus 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 by doing some benchmarking you begin to understand what is the lay of the land who's already doing what and from that maybe the next step is uh, tasting some of these different organizations and what they're doing to see what makes sense and where is the niche that you might help fill in some sort of uh, alliance. Um, my question would be, how many of you have heard of the National Girls Collabor Collaboration Project? Is it the Girls Clubs? Nope. We're that, just a few it hands. continues to grow its network. It's currently in, uh, has 24 collaboratives serving 34 states and facilitates collaboration between more than 12,000 organizations, indirectly serving over 5.3 million girls by having their, le their leaders trained in the philosophy, knowledge, and methods of what, what they're doing. They are looking to expand to serve another seven high-need areas. High-need areas includes states home to large populations of underrepresented girls. So this is just another example. So my, my advice would be, what do you know is already out there in the landscape like this? You know, find out something about this group that already seems to be in 34 states. And as you understand more of this, where is the, the niche that you might then serve either into an existing large network like this or a subset that, that you would form? That's well, what I would recommend. Well, would be to bring groups like this to all chat, since obviously and very few people raise their hands when you mentioned that group, you know, they sound like they're extremely large. And that's my point. There's a and lot out there like, like this. So we can actually talk. It doesn't have to be as formal as that. More just a forum or, you know, invite them. Invite other senators just to talk once a twice a year. Mm -hmm. Or invite other people to talk about what they're doing. And that's what we're trying to do. 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 Uh, because I don't think anybody's really doing it. Well, I guess the point is uh, to that is benchmarking. And I give you one example. You've got coming up in February, March. In February, you've got National Engineers Week. Under that arm, they do have a niche there with girls. So what are they doing in that, and how might you bring your conversation through that umbrella. You also have, in March, you have Women's History Month, and, and there is the Global Marathon that's going on uh, March 5th through 10th. It's an annual worldwide forum connecting professional women, college students, and girls for virtual and in-person conversations about education and careers in engineering and technology. These are just three quick examples of, as you look at, at your thought on this, how might you uh, and embed yourself in these existing things to figure out what's going on and where there might be a niche. Oh, I agree. And that's, what, what groups you mentioned actually illustrate why we need this even more. I mean, just because there are so many and they don't necessarily communicate. So this is just more trying to figure out ways so we can all communicate and share this information. It's not just focused on ones focusing on young women, just STEM as a whole. So. Yeah, so are you so looking to be more of a clearinghouse for all of these organizations? Maybe, I don't know. It's part of the discussion, kind of figure out maybe have an initial chat, you mm -hmm. know, and think maybe we go not ready for a press release or anything right now, but I would be interesting to at least have some sort of telecon or a meeting somewhere. We can invite all these groups and figure out the lay of the land a little better because mm -hmm. I just know talking to all the groups, they, most of them don't know what each other are doing, mm -hmm. or some of them do when they have some cross pollinization or mutual members, but very often it's the case that 
people promoting the same thing are often unaware of the same people, you know, same people, different people doing exactly the same thing. And I think we could really increase our effectiveness if there was more collaboration. So to broaden the discussion just a little bit, that's one great idea about really getting us closer together and um, benchmarking and sharing best practices. Are there other things that the panel or any audience member would suggest on, um, in the short term, what can be done to uh, encourage STEM? Most important. Really quickly, I'd just like to address his uh, his idea. And I, I and first of all, I want to clarify mm -hmm. that I don't think it's a bad idea at all. I work for a space education nonprofit that's here in um, the district. Um, we're actually in Greenbelt, um, and, but we have branches all over the of the U.S. And I'm pretty sure most of you probably don't know what it's called. Um, if you do know, it's Federation of Galaxy Explorers. And we do an after school. Um, OK, that makes me feel better. <laughs> um, but we are, um, in, in my experience over the last year um, of communicating with specifically space education groups, because that's our, our focus, is that we are very aware of each other. We, um, we're very small. <laughs> I'm the only paid employee of the organization. I work with around 37 volunteers. But we're very aware of NASA. And a lot of times, there's only so much you can do. I mean two-day conference to come meet you wonderful people is uh, quite a bit out of our schedule. And so while we appreciate um, having that connective effort, sometimes it's just Im impossible to keep track of all that. Um, and so if we could do it in a way that, that facilitated some sort of um, internet conference or you know conference calls and stuff in some way to do that digitally, um, it, would be, it would be fantastic. Um, the, my, my question was, um, speaking of, of, of communication, was that, um, I hate this phrase, <laughs> uh, those, uh, the, the whole those that can do and the whole those that can't teach um, bothers me. And I think this carries over, I mean, I've seen it carried over into my mentors um, when I was in college. Um, my favorite professor, who is an amazing guy and is now the, the director of um, Oregon Space Grant, Jack Higginbotham, um, he, you know, like spent a, a lot of time working with us and teaching and teaching lower level classes. He's an amazing professor, but he lost out on a lot of grants and didn't have as much respect within the department because he wasn't hardcore. He wasn't doing hardcore science and hardcore engineering. And it's really um, disappointing to me to see this um, and it's also I'm intensely frustrated right now because this is probably the fifth aerospace conference I've gone to in the last six months and this is the most people I've seen like in an auditorium attending an education panel and I've gone to conferences with you know literally like 1500 attendees and so um, I think there's a, a disconnect between, and, and I don't want to say um, between upper level management and stuff. I mean, we are very well supported by uh, SpaceX, Raytheon, you know, Lockheed, Boeing, everybody. I mean, they see the importance of the recruitment of their future workforce, but it doesn't trickle down. And I'm wondering if you guys can speak to um, some sort of incentive method to get these entry level engineers. And I'm not even talking about people that are, you know, pursuing their education and, and working up to PhD, but even people that are just going to graduate with a bachelor's degree, they're going to go straight in, maybe they'll pick up an MBA or a master's later. How do you connect to that workforce and say, look, just because you don't have a PhD or an MD um, and you, you know, aren't actively putting things on Mars doesn't mean you're, gonna, you're not going to be a viable role model? Partnerships. I think are the, the biggest thing. Um, one of the, the we work with um, lots of colleges in Boston, obviously, and but there's a new um, engineering undergraduate um, college called Olin College in in Wellesley, Massachusetts, and and it's been interesting working with them. It's a brand new college. It's only been around for about five years or so, and they're finding that their um, engineers are coming in and getting involved with some of our programs and wanting to teach. They didn't think they wanted to teach, so it's a nice, a nice connection to the point where Framingham State may be starting a graduate, un, an undergraduate engineering teaching program in, in conjunction with them. So I suggest that you find, and um, that's how we get credibility, and that's how your professor might have gotten it, is to work with other universities, et cetera, too, that that may have the researchers or work with NASA where they have the scientists. Um, you just have to really develop strong partnerships is what I would recommend. 
I'll, I'll add something here that I've found fascinating uh, working with industry and, and inside NASA is where they will take some of the the young employees that have just come on board, very, very young, and they need to understand project management. They've not done that themselves per se. And so they will put them onto a a um, maybe an outreach, uh, the first, first robotics, mm -hmm. where they will actually have them step in to help mentor a team. And in that six week process, I mean, that's a nice thing, mm -hmm. it's, it's contained within six weeks, they will work through an entire process of project management and doing that, you know, side by side with a, a young person, middle mm -hmm. school and high school. So there's one way that we try to take advantage of some of, of the development of our, our workforce in ways that has it returning to the community, touching students as role models, and then themselves learning some very viable skills of project management. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentations. They've been very enlightening. In the next panel, I'm going to be talking about sex and gender and its impact on health. And I often use the definition from the Institute of Medicine that when we look at gender, we're really looking at the psychosocial construct, which is very important. But also, when we look at sex, we look at the differences, similarities at the most basic chromosomal level, really a biological basis. A lot of our discussion has, I think, taken more of a gender approach the cultural context. I want to move a little fur further downstream, and I know it's probably a bit controversial, but really looking at it from a neurological process. Mm -hmm. How do men and women, boys, girls, process information? And our, our classrooms really geared more for the, the male model of teaching and how boys take in information, how they process it, how they use technology, and whether that's causing some kind of subtle discrimination that we really haven't begun to measure or really even acknowledge. But once we do that, we might do both sexes, both genders better. Any thoughts about that? Oh, the only thing I can go back on, and, and I'm sorry, it's anecdotal. Um, as a former classroom teacher, I was very sensitive to learning styles how, how, and, and different types of learning styles and being very conscious of what my learning style was and heaven forbid that I should try to teach the students based on what my learning style was because I may not be in aligned with theirs. So I began every uh, academic year uh, giving them a learning style test so that I could look across the, the portfolio of my students and understand where there were subcategories of, of different learning styles, strengths and weaknesses, and would then do my preparation based on those results. Um, at the same time, trying to help them grow areas where they might be weak in a learning style that wasn't their preference. But I was going to expose them to it all. and. and almost as important was to make sure that I did not just continually teach the way that was comfortable for me if it was not good for the students. How that relates back to what you're saying, I can't say exactly, but the point I'm trying to make is that I was trying to be very conscious of learning styles, and it wasn't a boy-girl thing, but the different brain, ways they learned. Brain-based educational research is really just starting to mm -hmm. take off. Um, I'm familiar with some studies that have looked at differences in science and engineering brains and how they work. I don't know about specific research on gender in STEM, but I think that, that would be a really great um, research area mm -hmm. in that, in brain-based studies. I mean, I'll just throw out very quickly, there's this anecdotal reports mm -hmm. that boys and girls can get from point A to Z, but they just have a different way to get there, and that boys may be more comfortable with latitude, longitude, working the GPS, and girls want to use landmarks, mm -hmm. and it's just the way we process. I've been hearing anecdotal reports, for example, even with the use of iPads and iPhones. I mean, I'd be curious how many women in the room are comfortable using it. It's not just because of nails, but hand-eye coordination and also electrical capacitance and whether they're able to really manipulate the technology. So I think these are interesting questions that could really, I think, transform the landscape. You know, I think that feeds into uh, a, an issue that I am very uh, conflicted about, and that is the issue of whether or not uh, um, mixed gender classrooms or uh, same-sex classrooms are better. I struggled that with that with my own uh, child, and <laughs> I struggle with it now, and I don't actually know what I think about it. But I know that the learning styles may be somewhat skewed between males and females. Uh, but I, I think that if, even if there are brain differences, 
that can be tied to different genders, that there's enough overlap in the tails of the distribution that maybe we need to be paying more attention to learning styles, as you were saying, Shelley, um, rather than segregating people by their gender on the assumption that because you're a female, you have a certain sort of learning. Uh, one of my frustrations, just as a human being, is uh, how many of my, my women friends cannot read a map? Uh, you know, and, and is that fear, or is that some, a different way of processing information? I don't know. I think it's processing information. Yeah, could be, whereas I'm a great map reader, so obviously I'm on the tail so of distribution of map reading. <laughs> practice. Practice, yeah. Practice? yeah. It could be. Could be. Right. Well, women will, women will turn a map around to help them orient better. So if you're looking at the street and you're on this side of the street and the map is showing you as being on that side of the street, I've, I've seen women turn the map around so they could get it in the view. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> but all of this is anecdotal, too. What we should really be looking at yeah. is yeah. what the research says. It's right. data. Yeah. yeah. Could you go to the... Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, I work at Temple University with the Spatial Intelligence and Learning Center. I'm, I'm a geologist, and, but uh, I work with a, n a number of cognitive psychologists. And um, in terms of the actual research, they've done a lot of research. Geologists are better at spatial reasoning than everyone else. No surprise. But um, one of the things that they noted was that when they did the baseline tests, um, women did score, um, the average score was lower in their spatial skill set um, in general than the men. However, with some practice, it actually evened out. Um, and it was only a minimal amount of actually practicing it. Actually, the bigger effect, um, it was a very small effect that the women were slightly lower. The highest and the lowest were the same for men and women. Um, but the um, biggest effect was actually after age 30 your spatial intelligence skills drop dramatically uh -oh. um, is one of the things that they found. So, um, so actually, it seems like practice is really the key to that, that it's, it's not really a difference. May I interject something? What I never understand... Okay. What I never understand is that they will say of women that we can't think three-dimensionally. Right. Who will actually... Um, Think of where the furniture goes in a house. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've never known to let people live in a two-dimensional house. And I know that most houses are, you know, furnished by women. Mm -hmm. So I always wonder whether we are good at furnishing houses because we have practice, like just was suggested, and some of the women are not as good at reading maps because they don't practice enough. Personally, I have no problem in three-dimensional thinking or in reading maps, and I don't have to turn it around either. So, you know. Yeah. I'd like to uh, come back to the comments that um, our enthusiastic and frustrated science teacher made a few minutes ago, uh, and I'll speak to my area of expertise, which is communication and mass media. Uh, we need to take civic responsibility for dealing with this problem of um, insufficient and um, lousy uh, depictions of uh, women in the sciences, in the mass media. The, it is, I think we can all agree, it's a social fact that the mass media are playing a larger and larger role in everyday life, and for kids even more so, which is sad. Uh, but um, my mentor, George Gerbner, was one of the leading um, scholars uh, in uh, study of mass media and effects of mass media content um, on children um, and on um, other groups' self-image. And um, 
he studied, uh, he did do a study of um, stereotyping of scientists in mass media. Um, he's also studied stereotyping of women in mass media, stereotyping of many other underrepresented groups. Um, and uh, for a while in the 70s and 80s, uh, even the U.S. Congress was inviting him to testify. And somehow or other, particularly with depictions of women, not just women scientists in the media, but women in general, I feel like we've, we've gone backwards over the past 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. And I, I would highly recommend for all of us, whether we have children or not, to be activists about this. And if you don't like the way that women are portrayed in a program you've seen, say so. There's always somebody right. you can write or somebody you can call. If you, if you really think it's gone over the line, contact the Federal Communications Commission because broadcasters have to be licensed to use the public airwaves. I mean, there are many, many ways to pursue this. Uh, the Media Education Foundation produces wonderful video products for educational use for classroom use. Uh, Jean Kilborn is probably the one of the best known scholars um, of uh, the depiction of, of women, and particularly the commodification of female sexuality in mass media content. Uh, and, and maybe we collectively uh, need to find a way to go to a group like the Association for Women in Science and say, can we help you prepare a grant proposal uh, to get the Media Education Foundation to do one of these video analyses, mm -hmm. one of these study projects on the way that women scientists are depicted in the mass media, whether it's a cartoon on Saturday morning or a movie that you pay $15 to go see on Friday night. I mean, if we don't like it, <laughs> One, we have a right to say so, and two, we also have a right to say, you know what, I'm not going to pull out my credit card next time. Thank you, Linda. That's, I've taken points down on those. <laughs> Hi, I teach physics, so I'm a hard, I've taught chemistry, hard science um, teacher, um, but my background is in chemistry. I have a degree in chemistry, went to a pretty good college, did pretty okay. Um, and then I decided, based on my experience as being a student and then also tutoring kids in, high, in uh, college and high school, um, I decided that I wanted to teach. And I wanted to teach for my career because I was very passionate about it. So it's my third, it's my third year of teaching. And I, I do, I really enjoy teaching um, the students. What you said earlier about it being the system, um, that is becoming very, very, very frustrating to me. Um, and, let's say. Oh, um, the big problem, there are, there's so many things out there for teachers to do, and we're saying, like, how can we get the teachers empowered to empower the students? Um, it's a big job to be able to use all these resources that are online and actually make sense of them, figure out how you're gonna incorporate it into your curriculum, especially when the attrition rate is ridiculously high. I think um, you all know what the attrition rate is like for teachers, um, and especially in higher education for science. Um, so when teachers are you know, like staying for three years and then leaving, or staying for five years max and then leaving, there's not a whole lot to base your practice off, off of. There's a lot of starting from scratch and doing it over. Um, and I mean, honestly, sometimes it's like, well, I mean, I do, I have a degree in chemistry, like I have the background, but sometimes it's like, you know, I could go and like do this instead of teaching. I really, I really want to teach, but like where's, where's the incentive that we're giving people who have science backgrounds to teach and to be able to keep on teaching? Um, yeah. And I think, I just think that we could be doing a lot better job, so I don't know. And I think it comes from um, the American public. A lot of the respect and the um, confidence in teachers has gone downhill since I can remember, which is not that long ago. <laughs> um, so, like, how can we make it go back to even how it used to be, maybe, with um, more confidence in teachers and more respect and trying to keep people to stay in the classroom. Um, it's a big problem I've seen yeah. in my three years. <laughs> so, I don't know. It's kind of quite, I guess it's a very big question, so. <laughs> I, would, I would suggest that you get, start to, you know, I know you're still getting your, your footing yeah. in teaching and everything, but look for your state science 
organizations to get engaged in and also look at NASA for a lot of their internships or externships that they have for teachers in the in summer programs and um, and try and find a, a mentor in your school do you have ment do you have state yeah I'm I'm fine I'm just saying like as a overall like general like what I've seen with teachers and it's not just me like attrition is a huge problem right. I'm gonna stay in education yeah. I'm gonna keep right. on teaching because I like to and I like the students um, and I like doing what I do but you know like how do you in general just keep teachers in the classroom and how do you get the people that went to school for science and have like chemistry and um, like planetary science degrees and stuff to actually come teach it's, like, you know, you what you're going through, is, it's also pretty cyclical, because when I started teaching 100 years ago, we lost, <laughs> it seems like that, uh, <laughs> we lost more than 50% of the teachers in my school at the end of the year, too. And um, the next year, it was like 30%. And then they, they kind of hung on. I don't know. They all just retired. And so now there's a whole new crop. So you're coming in, like, to the same culture that back in the 70s that we entered teaching in is that... You know, so many people started, but then they were getting hired away by the computer companies in Massachusetts and all sorts of different things, so, or just leaving because they, they didn't know what they were doing. Um, so it's, I think it's kind of cyclical, and, and if, you can get, if you can encourage those teachers who are really good and want to teach to hold on and, and help mentor them, too, that might help. Also, I finished my master's last year and learned about like the education policy and learning about um, all the policies that have happened in the past 10, 15 years and how they've changed to actually have you know our um, and our government come and kind of like change the way that it's been going and make it you know the whole idea. So. I, I love the passion. I'm so glad there is so much going on. I, I'm getting the high sign over here. No, two. I'll do Okay. One more quick and one really quick. Okay. Yes, I, I, I actually have a question. I, um, I was curious of, of all of you who are working in the area of STEM and Mars. and I need resources. I work with Civil Air Patrol, and we do a lot of outreach and STEM activities. I also remember Mars Society, and, I was, and I'm looking for good resources for how to take little problems that come up in Mars research and make them nice little hands-on mm -hmm. uh, demos that can be done sensibly. So I'm looking for touch points, you know, in the literature, in the on the web, in your personal experience, and you know, I probably can't answer the whole question now, but just a couple of things would be interesting if any of you have some good ideas about how you. Make sure, connection. sure. Talk to us um, at the break or, you know, later on today, and I think we have a lot of things that we can share with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Three ultra-fast points. <laughs> one, no one ever asks missionaries what keeps them going and what resources they can have to do their job. <laughs> two, this is really hard stuff. It's hard to be a scientist. It's hard to be an engineer. It's hard to be a teacher. It's just hard, and that's just how it is. The third thing is, and, and this is to mitigate that sort of cruel second statement, uh, I'm a scientist. I also function quasi-engineer, and I still do public outreach teaching engagements at least two a month. I have never been on an expedition to the field where I didn't bring at least one student, usually two or three, of any age category. And the fact of the matter is, if we do care about this stuff, and obviously we do because we took two days out of our work week to be here, 
We each individually take responsibility and we bring the resources to the table and we help do the teaching as well as the research and the engineering of the solutions. That's it. It's easy, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you for solving the problem. That's a great way to close. <laughs> That's a great way to close. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah.